the remains of Hurricane Ian still off the coast of Virginia almost a week later. Welcome to another edition of Forecast Lab. And yeah, there's the remains of Hurricane Ian still bringing down that cold air. Temperatures this evening, 59 in New York City, 58 at Boston. And we head out to the west. We're getting a bit of a warm up. The southerly return flow is starting up in Texas. Dew points are coming up from 30s and 40s up to 50s. So we are seeing that warm up and up to the north, some showers and storms around Clayton, New Mexico, Raton, Amarillo, and Clovis. Quick check out to the west. We've got fog, which is very typical for this time of year. We've got that upwelling along the Pacific coast. The cold current and all of that is conducive to stratus and fog. Some of that making its way into Portland and Seattle with that southwesterly flow coming on shore. And a quick look up in Alaska, stormy once again in the Gulf of Alaska, rain coming down from Ketchikan to Juneau, out to Valdez, and some snow in the Brooks Range. Still continued cold in northern Canada, seeing 20s, so it's not really super cold, but we are certainly in the deep freeze, and that's helping to generate this 1036 millibar high across the Northwest Territories. That's starting to look a little bit more like winter and helping to energize this front coming south through the prairies and into the Great Lakes region. The jet stream chart, 250 millibars near the top of the troposphere. Let's take a look at that. We've got light and variable flow across much of the country. You can see in the U.S. 20 to 30, 35 knots. The only jet activity we have is up there in Canada, stretching from Manitoba to Newfoundland. And there's another branch down along the Gulf Coast heading out into the Atlantic. Now, this branch here, it has some characteristics of subtropical flow. The sounding for Tallahassee does show that the axis of that jet, the, the core of it, is up at about... 40,000 feet. I might have to move that down so you can see that. Yeah, there you go. There's the strongest winds, 80 knots at Tallahassee, and that's going to be 200 millibars, about 40,000 feet. We do see it has little vertical extent down into the mid-levels, rapidly diminishes to about 20 knots at 18,000 feet. And for a pure polar front jet that's active, we want to see those winds up near 40 to 50 knots. We don't want to see it down near 20. So it does have subtropical jet characteristics, but if we look down lower, there is cold air near the surface. So I would be inclined to call that a polar front jet that's weakening and transitioning over to somewhat of a subtropical quality, I guess, if you want to call it that. So let's go back and look at the remains of Ian off of the East Coast. That's going to be right here. You can see that we've got markings for a decaying occlusion. And one important aspect to that, check out the thickness lines. That's going to be these markings right here. You can see that it's on the north side or the positive end side of those markings. So it's out actually here correlated with that cold core. So the main jet that's going to be over the thickness gradient, and that's going to be located on the cold side of that low. So it's somewhat detached from the jet stream dynamics and the warmer air out to the southeast. That's a look at it from the satellite, looking at the visible imagery. That's certainly a compact, vigorous low. Pretty easy to see where the center is. It's going to be right there. And on the official government chart from the National Center for Environmental Prediction. That does confirm that we're dealing with a occlusion, and the triple point is located quite a ways off of the coast, off of Cape Cod, maybe about 500 miles out to sea. And I think there's probably a front that I missed right in this area, maybe right in there. It's It's been kind of a busy day here, but it is a weak front. Temperatures on one side in the mid to upper 70s, on the other side in the mid 60s. And 
the tiniest of dynamic support. That's it right there. The front running about like that, the warm front kind of like that. So that jet is about where we would expect it. And I almost missed it. But you know, that does happen sometimes when you're also dealing with much larger systems. But let's talk about that occlusion. Now, this is a diagram for anafronts and catafronts. We're not going to really cover that today, but it is a great diagram for showing the structure of the occlusion, and that's going to be north of the triple point, which is located where I have these two dots. So up here, that's the occluded system, and that little low that's off of Virginia, that would be located right there. And you can see how the thickness field is off to the south, the stronger jet stream dynamics also off to the south, and the warmer temperatures located down in this area with the warm sector. How does the occlusion form? Well, this is not a great diagram, but it is pretty understandable. We start out right here. You've got a warm front and a cold front, and the cold front is catching up to the warm front. That happens pretty close to the low pressure area. And there's the warm sector, and you can see that when the cold front catches up, the warm air gets squeezed and it gets displaced up above the surface. And the result is over here on the right. You can get one of these two results. One is a cold occlusion where the cold front is dominant. You can see it wedging in there. And the other instance is the warm occlusion where the warm front air is colder. And that causes the cold front to ride up and over the top. Now typically what we see in the lower 48 is going to be the cold occlusion. And the warm occlusion happens typically off the Pacific coast. Here's another map for you to look at. Can you, can you guess where the occlusion is? Well, if you guessed right here, you are correct. This other low that's further off to the east, that's going to be the main baroclinic low. And that represents the mature stage of baroclinic development. And as that baroclinic low becomes further developed, it gradually separates itself and moves into the colder air over time. And of course, that's because there is a cold front and a warm front associated with that low. And eventually the cold front will catch up to that low. And that'll shift the entire baroclinic zone, the triple point area, further off to the south. And that's going to be a prime area for cyclic development. And you've probably heard that word cyclic with supercells, and it's much the same at these larger scales. Here's a better diagram that I found showing the different occlusion types. And again, the one that you're going to see most here in the U.S. is going to be this one here. Cold air in this situation is a lot colder than the air further out ahead. That can be reversed, as you see down here. But what we see with these cold occlusions, you can see the surface front is going to be out ahead of the surface trough. That surface trough is located right here, and it's the result of a deeper layer of warm air aloft. So does that make sense? So finding that deeper warm air, you can use the thickness chart for that. Take a look up there off the coast of Massachusetts, that's going to be a thickness ridge. So that's going to correspond to the deepest warm air near that occlusion. And I've got the front back out to the west of that. And so that's going to represent a warm occlusion. Now, once again, that's typically not what we see here in the U.S. However, the cold air up to the north is colder. This air down here is warmer. It's had a lot of time to pass over the warmer land and the Gulf Stream waters. So that's pretty much going to set up a warm occlusion as far as that system goes. So hopefully you've learned a little bit about how occlusions work. So yeah, next time we have that happen, like up there in Canada, follow the charts and see what's going on. If you like temperature extremes, I've got bad news for you. Nothing for today. Same story for tomorrow. For Friday, some warm temperatures show up in the West Coast region. We're expecting 77 at Seattle. That'll break the record. And Portland will be tying the record at 83. Another hot one for Saturday. 
I do wonder whether fire season is over. A little bit of moderation on Sunday. Nothing on Monday. So nothing in the near term as far as unusual temperatures, except for some heat late this week in the northwest. Okay, let's take a look at that GFS forecast. We're going to look at the pressure, thickness, and precipitation. The pattern is going to be very La Nina-like, so a lot of northwesterly flow, dry in the eastern part of the country, actually dry across all of the country, and colder than usual in the eastern U.S., so starting this out, we see the first burst of cold air coming out of Canada into the Great Lakes region for Friday, going into Saturday. Not much after that. However, check out British Columbia and Washington. Very potent system, dropping southeast out of that area. Cold front, warm front, jet. We can infer that from the thickness contours. And back behind it, cold core, cold core low with cold core showers. So that's going to sink into the Great Basin area and not too sure what's going to happen after that. The GFS thinks it's going to fizzle around 13th or 14th. And there's another burst of cold air coming south out of Canada. And you can see this predominant offshore flow, which will scour out the Gulf and make it hard to get moisture back into the plains when we get that moisture return. So I wouldn't really count on that. And continuation of the pattern at the very end, not much change, but we developed this little system out there, some isentropic lift overrunning, and possibly frontogenesis in Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. So that'll bear watching for the 19th. Anyway, that's a long ways off. We'll see how that goes, and that'll do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. And that's all I've got for today. Just as a note, we will be on autumn break. I usually try to take about four breaks every year. So that's going to be next week and part of early the following week. So we're going to be off on the 10th, 12th, 14th, and 17th. And then we'll be back to normal on the 19th. So considering there's not a whole lot of weather going on, it's probably a great time to go ahead and do that. But we'll be back on Friday the 7th, just two days from now. Hopefully we'll see you then. Have a great Wednesday evening. Take care and enjoy this footage from Greg of Aerial Footage in San Antonio. See you in a couple days. Bye-bye. Let's take a deep dive into Retro Forecast Lab and go back to 2017. This is the opening of the show. Enjoy. <laughs>